There's been a lot of talk lately about sports science, its relative usefulness, and if we should even be paying attention to what's happening in this world. Obviously, tearing down Dr. Mike's dissertation has probably led to a lot of this talk, but it's important to note that it's been going on for a few years now. It's led to people asking some really hard-hitting questions, and today we're going to talk about the relative usefulness of sports science, if it really applies in an area today where we have hundreds and hundreds of online resources, and what we actually get from the area of sports science. So sports science is a general science degree specializing in all the things involved in human exercise and adaptation. What you're going to get is a broad view of anatomy, physiology. You're also going to look into some coaching science. You're going to look into some rehabilitation science, a brief look at nutrition, all of the areas you generally associate with sport and people trying to exercise and become more healthy. I feel like a lot of people might necessarily have a great understanding of what sports science is or what it brings to our area in terms of coaching and SNC. So we're going to use a quick demonstration here to show you how a sports science degree is usually made up. So I feel like a lot of people might necessarily know this, but generally speaking, most college degrees or third level education are built kind of like Lego bricks. We take fundamental learning areas, we tend to stack them in with other year groups, and then as you go later on in your years, you'll tend to specialize more and more. Sports science or exercise science is the exact same as most other degrees in this case. Generally, sports science groups are stacked in with things like healthcare sciences, general sciences, physical education, teaching, and psychology. For our first year or two of study, you'll tend to be in the normal courses that you consider to be in on any other science course. This would be mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, all of the things you'd expect a sports scientist to know. Let's take, for example, the anatomy and physiology. We'll usually tend to be in with the physiotherapy year groups for this. So it'll give you a great idea for where things are in the body, how certain muscles might affect certain movement patterns. If you're a weightlifting coach, you need to know your quads work while you're squatting. Then as you get later on in your years, you get slightly more into the applied and the specific areas of sport. So these might be things like coaching and pedagogy. Obviously other year groups from other subjects will have to learn these things too, but generally we're gonna be learning a slightly different version of that. Similarly, we look at anatomy and physiology. You start looking at things like biomechanics, and dynamics of human movement. These are things that only really sports science groups are going to learn. The problem here is that without the field of sports science and without these specific learned courses, none of us would know anything. The problem here with many people's arguments against sports science is that we know pretty much everything we need to know and why do we need to go and do all these BS studies and look at things that are already known? Well, we're gonna talk about that today and why we certainly don't know everything we need to know about muscles, about exercise physiology, about exercise psychology and why this area is so important to us. Essentially, sports science and the specific study of sports science allows us a fundamental level of understanding about human movement, about exercise science. And then as coaches or as athletes, we can layer it in with our own experience. We can start testing things out and trying them. But when something works, we probably have a good understanding of why it works. Or if it's not working for you, why that mightn't have worked when you tried it. There's a somewhat misguided notion out there that we'd have all figured this out on our own if coaches just had enough athletes and enough time to do it. But this is definitely not true. You do not have enough time in the year. You don't have enough years in your life to figure all these things out. And even if we look at something as simple as just exercise for the sake of health, how are you going to know whether you should be weight training or cardio training? If we're doing cardio training, should it be long, steady, slow distance? Or should that cardio training be really high intensity interval training? Nobody's gonna figure it out with it just one lifetime of study. And we certainly won't figure it out if we're not really good at measuring things and assessing how well they work. There are certainly some incredibly intelligent coaches out there. Some of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life have been involved in coaching at both professional and amateur levels, but simply working on the premise of we'll try something, see if it works or it doesn't work, and then we'll try and improve on that next time isn't enough. As humans, we need to be striving for a better fundamental level of understanding of exercise, of sports, of our ultimate human performance, and just coaches and athletes alone can't do that. Right, so to finally illustrate this point, we're gonna use a kind of three-tiered thing. It's certainly not putting sports science up on a pedestal, or it's certainly not putting athletes down at the lowest tier here, but we're gonna look at a comparison and we look at a machinist, an engineer, and a theoretical physicist, or somebody working in an institution. 
So for my example here, I want you to imagine the athlete training away in a similar situation, a machinist working in a factory. That machinist might say, I don't need to see the drawings. I don't need to see the material specs because I've made this part a hundred times. I don't need to think about anything. I can just do it on previous experience and what I've learned when I've made that part the other 99 times. And I understand how I'm going to get that result from doing this specific process. The problem exists then obviously when that part has to change, when we need to work with different materials, when we need different types timelines, we need to produce things more efficiently or more effectively on the tools we have. If we're just relying on the athlete or the machinist to make those changes on their own machine and try and come up with a better system or a different system, they're basically going to have to work through trial and error. They might be able to talk to their other machinist friends, but generally speaking, they're going to have to make that part a number of times, make something slightly different, trial it, make something slightly different, trial it. And this is the trial and error method. It will certainly work, but it will take hundreds of iterations before we come up with something that will work and we might get to the point where we'll never actually optimize the system or we'll never optimize the part we're trying to make because we're simply just going to trial something until we get something that kind of works. In the SNC world, if an athlete has to do something different that they haven't done before, generally speaking, they'll get a coach. That coach will write them a program or it will change their technique in some way, which will allow them to achieve these new results. Obviously, in our example from earlier, that machinist might look to an engineer to start specking that new part, giving them new drawings and allowing them to reach further into an area of understanding that they mightn't have had before. The engineer is qualified and has a very good understanding of this area, similar to how a coach will have done coaching courses and multiple years of coaching and training athletes, where they have this basic level of knowledge, a fundamental underpinning of what they're trying to do, and they have a reference library of data that they can go back and check. I know I need this outcome, so I'll use this process. In this case, the engineer or the coach doesn't have to use a trial and error method quite so much because they have a known outcome from a previously studied problem and you Usually those reference banks or those previously ran programs are going to simply be able to plug in to what you're trying to do and we'll get a better part or a better physical outcome from it. At this point, however, the coach or the engineer might come along and say, well, I have this massive reference bank of data, whether that's on the internet or whether that's on some fundamental system we have. And so I don't necessarily need somebody in an institution or university studying all these small areas of dynamics, mechanics, look at material science, trying to figure out what's going on because I have this known bank of data. Certainly that's true, but I want you to understand that that bank of data never would have existed without that university or that institutional level of study, looking at the basic fundamentals of material science, of dynamics, of all of these different areas. And so it's very important to understand the need for the theoretical work and the need for the experimental work, just leading to having better reference banks. The second thing comes along here and the second problem we'll really experience is when we want to get better solutions to new problems. In many cases, the engineering world and the sports where will be quite similar here, where people are constantly looking for better solutions to problems that are popping up that they mightn't have foreseen before. Whether it's athletes who want to take part in more sports, whether it's athletes taking part in competitive sports later in their life, or whether it's people coming up with exercise as medicine for different health conditions and things they're coming up against in life, all of these things might necessarily have a known answer. And so it is very important that above the level of the engineer or the coach, we have this institutional level of study. Now look, I don't want to state the obvious here, but there's always been a disconnect between the theoretical and the practical applied world. It's always how it has existed. In recent years, the last two decades, this term of pracademic or somebody who is very academic and looking into studies and publishing work and also a practicing SNC coach or something like that in the background, that's certainly become more popular. There's always been this disconnect. All I want you to understand today though, is that each of these different groups needs each other. Everybody is standing on each other's shoulders. Everybody is able to exist because the other groups are still doing their job. Now look, there are some fantastic coaches out there. Coaches who have come up with amazing training programs, who have ran long-term training interventions, looking at different groups, did it in a very scientific manner and came up with their own findings because of that. That is certainly true. But even within those programs, the exercise selection, the progressions used, the amount of volume used, how they'll manipulate volume over the course of a block, all of these things exist because at some point, somebody studied this and wrote it down. And unfortunately, you're gonna have to admit it that that's what sports or exercise science are. Now look, we have one of the best squat programs you could ever think of running. It consistently adds 20, 25, 30 kilos to people's squats, whether it's over the course of eight weeks or 12 weeks. But this squat program would never have existed without people formally studying the back squat, formally studying strength training, and 
Although when I was doing my undergraduate in sport and exercise science, I certainly wasn't handed any of this programming and it still took a massive amount of application, trial and error, using it with different athletes, but it still wouldn't have existed if people never actually formally studied the squat. Even just looking at the squat itself, the squat is probably brought around through a combination of two people. Obviously, people have been sitting down and standing up for a long time, but the idea of using a squat to train people to be more athletic and more explosive is generally thought of to be a brainchild of two coaches. One, a Prussian gymnast, and another person, a British army coach. At this point, they were called knee bends, but through consistent study and writing down their findings, they popularized the knee bend and made it into what it is today, the barbell back squat. And now look, I can already hear you shouting, oh, we'd have gotten all this if we just tried it and errored it enough times, if we just got enough experience in the gym. I read this book when I was 15 that taught me all this stuff. You still need a basic understanding of anatomy and physiology. You still need to understand the biology, the chemistry that's happening within the body itself. And you cannot learn any of these things if people aren't working for you in institutions trying to study this. Now on to some of the more negative aspects. It's undeniable that sports science these days has gotten a bit of a bad name. There's a bit of a black mark against it. Obviously the Dr. Mike thing isn't the only reason people are asking questions here. And there are a couple of reasons that make some of these questionings quite justified. Firstly, because of a handful of factors, sports science is being published in very journals year on year and many of these papers are just absolute tripe. They don't offer anything to the overall bank of knowledge working towards better sports performance but many other fields have exactly the same level of terrible research going on. It's just that most people don't read medical journals or physiotherapy journals or biochemistry journals on the weekend for fun. And because of that, there are less of these smaller type journals publishing papers, and we don't really have a popular science paper where people are gonna regularly look into masters or PhD level research papers and really nail down the details. Look, an example of this is from the medical world. In 2002, there's a large scale paper published saying that HRT for females of a certain age group might in fact be damaging to their cardiovascular health. Just three years later, this paper was strongly refuted and broadly it's been thrown out as a general belief. But what we have now is a whole generation of doctors who initially heard it might be damaging to certain females to have HRT. And because of that, it has become nowhere near as popular as it probably should have become. This isn't just happening in the medical world. It's not just happening in the sports science world. It's not just happening in the pharmaceutical world. It's happening absolutely everywhere where papers are being published. What we have here is a small bit of observer bias. And we certainly have another thing happening here where there is massive pressure on people involved in institutions and universities to publish papers every single year. And they're on a quota system. Like for years, it was thought of that physiotherapists could use ultrasound to promote muscle healing. Most of these papers have been trialed and they've been repeated and those studies certainly aren't finding the same things they would have found in the initial cases where certain institutions would have said it was very useful it appears not to be that useful anymore does that mean we should stop research in physiotherapy absolutely not does it mean we should stop medical research of course we wouldn't do that that is an absolutely crazy thing to think we just have to do better research maybe publish slightly less of it and allow ourselves a bit more time to have better study designs and get more useful results from it. I mentioned this earlier, right? But there is massive pressure on PhD students, on lecturers, on TAs, on anyone working in postgraduate science, particularly in SES, sport and exercise sciences, to publish papers consistently. Their job relies on it. In many cases, for people who are in a junior lecturing role, they might be expected to have their name on three or four papers every single year. Certainly, as we get later into careers in exercise science, you might only be expected to publish one or two re really hard hitting papers in really high impact journals every year, but that's still a massive amount. When we look at the big keystone papers in exercise science, papers that first initially put the link between the amount of activity you're doing on a daily basis and your heart health, these papers took decades to do. They were studies that looked at hundreds, if not thousands of people, followed them for five to 10 years, and first came up with the conclusions that people who are exercising regularly have better heart health. These were papers done back in the 50s and 60s, looking at bus conductors 
conductors versus their colleagues who worked in an office and looking at postal workers who walked and cycled versus their colleagues who were on a truck or in a van. These papers are massive, both in terms of their time and monetary investment, and we just don't see studies being done like this anymore. In a world where you have to have so many papers coming out on a quarterly basis or a bi-yearly basis, you just don't get studies of this veracity. It's not that the science doesn't exist, it's not that we don't have really skilled and intelligent people working in these domains, it's simply just that there's such a need for papers to be published, and this is why we have so many journals publishing so many papers looking at things like exercise interventions that last somewhere between six and eight weeks. It's just probably not going to be effective enough. So look, I hope I've given you some level of basic understanding of what sport and exercise science might look like. I also hope you've gleaned a slightly better understanding of whether you're a, an athlete, a coach, or somebody working in a university, why you need all three of these user groups working together to get the best possible outcomes for sport. It's certainly not an area without its problems. It's certainly not something we also want to withdraw all our funding and money and time away from. It is a very valuable area of study with some incredibly talented people working within it. It's just getting a bit of a bad rap at the moment.